Men först en person som jag var väldigt fundersam kring hur han skulle vara när vi två träffades. Jag tittade på videor där han var tuff och han hade brudar som krälade på honom och han hade den där hårda tuffa lucken och det är den världsberömde rapparen och hiphopparen 50 Cent. Men det blev ett överraskande möte och jag mötte en klok analytisk person som gav en bra bild av hur det är att växa upp i ett ghetto när man har en mor som är knarklangare och skjuts när man är 12 år och dessutom själv blir skjuten med nio skott. Så här gick det till när jag mötte 50 cent. If I go back and listen to the first lyrics you wrote, mm -hmm. the first songs, it's it's really a, a dark side of your life. I mean, it's really struggling. Yeah. As a kid, it seemed that you, as many other kids, didn't have a chance. Right. When when I'm writing that material in the beginning, Power of the Dollar and uh, Guess Who's Back, that that material. That's uh, like a f in first person that actual struggle at mm -hmm. that point. Like there's nothing, nothing changing. There's nothing. I'm absolutely crazy at that point because I'm crazy enough to believe in myself without mm -hmm. much around to support it. It's a lot of dreams yeah. in it. So I'm chasing that in a different way at that point. Like I started to gain momentum, like where you start to feel like you're accomplishing some things. So. It, it created a, a, a energy that I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I just I say crazy because a person that can come up with something and believe in it like it's, it already rings true to them. You might call that person crazy when it's not actually when it hasn't come to pass mm -hmm. at that point. So a lot of people that I grew up around would look at me and think I was crazy then, but they understand it now. Crazy enough to dream and believe that there was going to be a change. Yeah, and go after it. Mm -hmm. I know you lost your mother at 12 years old, but mm -hmm. your grandmother was an important person. Was she also my, a role model, sort of? Yeah, my grandmother was like, she's the only person that I didn't want to disappoint. Mm -hmm. you know, and that I, was important, Yeah. to have somebody like that. Yeah, so she, like, even when, when I decided the temptations that, that came into my life with my mom's choices. Because th when I actually started to hustle, the people that I interacted with and was around would call me Lil Sabrina. Because mm -hmm. they already knew my mother, and this is how it was introduced to me easier than it would have been to the, any other kid. Like, I, hus I started hustling when I was like 12. So it was in between three and six when they thought I was in the after school program. I've always had to be aggressive enough to get by in the environment and then be my grandmother's baby in the house. So with her, as far as she's concerned, if when someone says something that reflects my actions outside, she has no idea mm -hmm. what you're talking about. She's looking at you like. Mm -hmm. But you did disappoint her. I did do the things that people said I did outside. Mm -hmm. But she can't even see me being a part of those actions or activities because in the house I immediately turned into her baby like mm -hmm. you know and she just looks at me like because she offered the compassion or love that she would offer her grandchild I'm her first grandchild mm -hmm. and she believed in you so and her only daughter her, her only child had actually died of, of nine children mm -hmm. when my mom got killed so every time she seen me it was almost like she would see my mother and then come pet petting at me and stuff. My grandfather used to get upset and say, you keep petting the boy, let him, let him be, he's going to turn him into a girl. Mm. <laughs> Is she still alive? My grandmother, yeah. yeah she's... So what does she say today when she sees you? Well, I mean, she, she doesn't like the whole experience because we're in the middle of it. It, it doesn't... Uh, Like she'll smile or she'll laugh at different things when I say it to her because she knows it's true, true, the way she saw things. I remember she she wanted to walk me home from school when it was 
kids way bigger than me that was, I mean, way smaller than me that was walking home already from school. And I told them, I could, I could walk home myself. It's only two streets to cross. Like, it ain't like main streets. But, like, for her, I was st still her baby, like the mm. youngest baby. So it was a disappointment for her to tell her that I can walk myself home. And, she, and she'll laugh at it now, but she remembered it hurting her feelings mm. at that point. But you, you, uh, you gone through a lot of uh, problems, and uh, what what was the driving force that took you to the day, to the way you and the situation you you are today? Well, I, I fell in love with music. Was it the music? It was the music. I mean, like hip hop, it had that thing that like the the guys, they had the things that the drug dealers had too. Mm -hmm. They had the jewelry, the nice cars, the, those things that were flint point, and it just wasn't doing the same thing. It was it was doing something completely different. Clean. Yeah, and I um, I was lucky enough to run into Jam Master J from Run DMC, and he I could rap like I already figured out how to listen to other artists' material and say recite it back you know, in cadence the way it's supposed to, but I uh, um, learned how to count bars, learn song structure and the different things that, you know, I was trained to do under Dre, under Jam Master J's tutelage at that point. And then from there I moved on because it was, it was such a slow pace of things happening. It wasn't happening fast enough mm. for me. But but it's interesting also to see that when Eminem uh, picks you up sort of or mm see you as an, the artist you really are. Skyrocket. Yeah, yeah skyrocket. Yeah. And in L.A., they really love you. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to New York, and then it's like they are... They, didn't, they but, don't really like your you know what? being so successful, as I see in your lyrics. Yeah. Is New that York, true? In New York, because the music business is based in New York City. All of the ma major companies have office spaces, employees, representation of their company in New York. And I'm from New York, and I had extreme momentum on the street level to the point that uh, M had heard of the material and listened to it, and Dre heard of it. And M's from Detroit, and Dr. Dre's from Los Angeles. I, I developed a, the ability to do things that um, unsigned artists weren't able to do at that point. I generated enough interest to have the bootleggers sell my CD for me, so it made them my marketing team. Instead of uh, what, what's a uh, what's a nightmare for an established artist is a, is a blessing for an unsigned artist. But but I I mean also uh, your old, I mean the people that were still in your neighborhood mm -hmm. and that were still involved in in drugs and all that. They didn't really like your, well, you know, being so successful. No. As if I if I go through. No, they the don't. Next, they I don't. Didn't. Like that. When you go, when you get an opportunity to do something and they see it and it's like, they get angry when they don't understand. Confusion makes people angry. You know, so they go what like they don't understand it, and you're saying things that they can relate to and that they they. Uh, they feel what you're saying in actual music because it's coming from the actions and activities that go on in the environment, but they don't understand how you figured that out mm -hmm. when they have no idea how to do it. Mm. And um, but but you seem to be quite disappointed. disappointed. Why couldn't they see? I mean, you taking yourself, I mean, out of that problems and drugs and all that. Well, you know, a lot of times people aren't prepared for change. Mm. You know, they want things to stay the same. And within the cycle of things that go on in the environment that I come from, you're not supposed to make it out of that. Like, everybody ends up in, in the, the same, same cycle. cycle. What, what would you say, how would you describe your neighborhood today? Is it any better? Oh, it's you worse. Have now Obama as a president? Has there been any change? <sighs> no, no. So it's a lot know. worse. Well, the drug worse. trade. Yeah, the drug trade is gone. So, like, this, the, the money is not there that was there when the influence, my influences were uh, 
seeing how much success they were having in short short periods. Mm -hmm. With the, the money. The money was, you know, was drawing you towards it, towards that. And um, now that money's not there anymore. So now it's, they don't have direction. They don't have structure. So the kids are there and they're doing things out of just having idle time. Idle time is, is no good for them. Like they sit and then. So what do, what do, you, what do you see in the future? How would I mean, things change? Well, they got to start trying to develop some kind of structured living for them, mm -hmm. for the younger kids down there. I mean, it's just, regardless if it's programming after school or whatever it is in the facilities they already have to keep them off the street before. If we go back to your life, I mean, I know that a turning point was when you got shot with mm -hmm. nine bullets, mm -hmm. which is incredible that you survived. And when you look death in the eye like that, maybe something happens. Well, I mean, you absolutely recognize that you're not in control. Mm -hmm. That's that point that you would uh, identify with your higher power and say that they, that, that would be responsible for why you're able to survive it, you know, and... You felt that, that you have a responsibility to... Yeah, at first, first, following actually being shot, you hurt so bad that when you get hurt like that, either your fear consumes you or you become a bit insensitive. Mm -hmm. And it's first, it's the fear factor kicks in and you're afraid because it just happened and you're, like, paranoid a little bit and then... In order to stop being paranoid, you start being the aggressor or a little more aggressive. And it started to bleed through into the music, so it helped me create material like Mini Men for a Get Rich or Die Trying. And some of the things that I put out on the mixtape circuit reflected that energy. Mm -hmm. It's like psychotherapy to you, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's all to a write part. all these lyrics. It's and a part through. of what's going on with me mentally yeah. in stages. And it's, so it's something, it's like my early material, it just, it feels, it's just angry. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot. Of, You're not angry anymore. You, you look very in harmony, sort of. Well, yeah, I'm in a good space. I, um, but what have you done with all that anger that you were carrying around? Well, at that point, I got a chance to, to see, I got everybody back that I had a problem with. I made them watch me do good. The best way to get someone back, uh, revenge, is to be successful in front of them. It is painful to a person who can't mm -hmm. figure out what to be passionate about, mm -hmm. or you know, to for them to just watch you continue going up, and they're just sitting there, just looking. Mm -hmm. And it's like that's that's a the ultimate punishment. But if if I look at your videos, it's, there's a lot of pimps and they are dressed yeah. like, uh, you know, with jewelry <laughs> and all that sort of thing. And all these beautiful girls around you. Was that a dream of yours or is it part of the uh, rap culture? It, no, it's a part of <clears throat> the actual environment. The neighborhood that I come from it had some, we went down by Queensbridge Housing Projects in the evening, you, you see girls out on a stroll. You know, it exists. It exists in Hunts Point, in mm -hmm. the Bronx. It's like these places, they're really there. So when you're writing it, this is where the connection is. Like, people look at it and go, oh, I can't believe you wrote that. But you chose to write a song about a portion of life or, or that lifestyle that those people have Recognize. completely embraced. And, they, and they, they like it because you can offer all of the things that are probably not traditionally the right things to offer. Mm -hmm. Through music, you can actually do it. And like film and television, when you make a movie, uh, a writer will tell you that a film is art imitating life. Mm -hmm. And music is uh, words put together that, that uh, create an energy. Mm -hmm. But inside of that, it's always a message, sort of. Yeah. It's saying that... Um, Within tradition, like, the concept of taking care of women is not a bad concept, but the concept of taking care of a woman who has to be taken care of is terrible to me. You know, so when uh, she has her own 
actual drive on goals on things, then it's fine to take care of her. But if she doesn't have those things, it's like ugh, a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And within the the lifestyle of with traditional, the role that a, uh, a man would play within tradition would be the financial support of the actual relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, the only other, the other extreme of that would be limping. So I put that into the actual writing at different points mm -hmm. to suggest that it's not okay to just give everything. But you also had those dreams yourself. I mean, to earn that money and have those cars and I mean, yeah. window shopping is one of your songs yeah. and you know. All those things that represent. But you have it today. Was it uh, as, did it make you as happy as you thought it would do? You know what? It's, money to me is freedom. It is. Yeah, it's the ability to come and go as you mm. please. I can invest in my own ideas. I don't have to convince anyone to believe in me because I've earned enough to make it happen myself. Mm. I, I also would like to ask you about trust because trust is something that you easily lose if you mm -hmm. grow up in, in a place yeah. like you did. But, um, and there's a song when the guy is in prison, I don't know mm -hmm. if it's you, and you are asking 21 One questions. questions. Yeah. If I didn't smell so good, would you still hug me? If I got locked up and sent this to a quarter century, could I count on you to be there to support me mentally? If I went back to a hoopty for my bands, would you poof and disappear? Like some of my friends, if I was hit and I was hurt, would you be by my side? If it was time to put in work, would you be down to ride? I'd be out and feeling, chilling, drive. I was in a car, I had an experience, I was in a car, and a song was playing, and it was, uh, it was an LL Cool J record. i never forget it, right, because the girl who was in the car with me, she was so engaged in what he was saying that, that he was just talking to her. And I says, how do I, how do I do that? Like, to a female, how do I make her so engaged in what I'm saying that she's it was like, and the only way, the way I, what I came up with is the question. Because when I ask you a question, you're engaged and you offer your response. Mm. So within the 21 questions concept, I was able to make like women in the crowd do different things. Like I, I would say things and they would shake their head yes. Like when I looked in the direction, when I asked that question, like they would answer me. So it was like they completely done toned everybody else out around them, and when they make eye contact, they uh, would give me the response that I wanted for the actual record. So I was a attempting to make the song that, within our nature, we have habits. It's like if uh, there's slight mannerisms that you have, like you. You go with your eyes, you talk with your eyes, and you slightly nod your head to give me confirmation that I'm... As I did now. That you understand, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those things. And and if if you just looked at me and and didn't offer that slight nod or, or anything, I would be unsure that you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And probably reach further, trying to get you get confirmation that you, you follow where I'm going in conversation and that's what I was doing by asking the questions was getting them engaged with it and giving them scenarios that coincided with the content and the material that I had prior to that. You know? mm. Like I, I wrote I'm high all the time on a record and I don't use drugs. Mm. I don't smoke, I don't drink. Mm. I never did. I stayed away from it because it was an easy option. I could have nice have something that was nice, which was my motivation for being there in the beginning. Or I could actually get high on my new record. The first song I released is called New Day. Mm -hmm. I've listened to that. And it's Alicia me, Keys. Alicia uh -huh. Keys, and Dr. Dre. Mm -hmm. And the record, I start the song off saying, you can hit your knees on the church floor and pray for better. I'll push the door on the liquor store and see what it gets you. For me, I got to be on top. You know, so what you see consistently when you go through low-income areas is you'll see the liquor stores, and you'll see the churches. Because the vice that people use, some people want to drink to forget about it, temporarily 
remove themselves from what they're they're feeling emotionally, and others will go pray mm-hmm. that it gets better, you know. So I wrote those th- those things into the lyrics on this album. I have a lot of questions, but I know your our time is out. It was so interesting to listening to you and talking to you. I enjoyed it. Thank you, and have a really nice day in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you.